I have to say, there's been a bit of tweaking with the title. Um, no longer do we have a Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, but a Minister for Torres Strait, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships. Um, and I hope that that does, in fact, signify a different sort of relationship between government and First Nations Queenslanders, uh, because as some of the commissioners have said, um, it's about doing things together in partnership and not having governments continue to do things uh, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So with that, can I start by acknowledging that we meet on the land of the Turrbal and the Jagara people? Can I pay my respects to their elders, past and present? And can I acknowledge all of the elders who are in the room? And thank you for your um, custodianship, for your sharing of culture and traditions, and your preparedness to walk down the path towards true reconciliation. I'd also, of course, like to acknowledge many of the dignitaries who are in the room today. Firstly, can I acknowledge Noel Pearson, the founder of the Cape York Partnerships. Um, can I also acknowledge Fiona Jose, and I'm sorry that I missed all of your speech, but um, what I did here was incredibly inspirational. Thank you, Fiona. Can I acknowledge, of course, Professor Bronwyn Fredericks, uh, Vice, Pro-Vice-Chancellor of Indigenous Engagement at the University of Queensland, but very importantly, was one of the commissioners who was part of the uh, QPC uh, inquiry into um, uh, discrete Indigenous communities within Queensland. Can I, of course, acknowledge Michael Brennan, Chair of the Australian Government Productivity Commission, um, to Dr Jackie Huggins, who I've known for a very long time, National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, and to all of the Family Responsibilities Commissioners. Uh, can I acknowledge all of you here today and can I pay tribute to the significant work that you have done in your communities? Firstly, I do want to thank you, um, thank the Commissioners um, for their incredible work. I had an opportunity to sit down with some Family Responsibility Commissioners in the community of Dumaji not too long ago. And it, is quite, it was quite evident to me then, but it was certainly reinforced uh, in your contribution just then. Uh, the enormous pride that you take in your role as commissioners and the incredible elevation of community leadership that has occurred through the Family Responsibilities and Welfare Reform Program uh, in your communities. But as we know, when the FRC first began, there was a critical need to stabilise the environment within communities to provide a solid foundation for change. And I think we heard that firsthand from the contribution just now. This included uh, restoring social norms and re-establishing local Indigenous authority and enabling engagement in the real economy and increased home ownership. The leadership and local authority that has developed over the 10 years of the FRC and welfare reform in Cape York is identified as a key highlight of the FRC model. It is also important to acknowledge that the challenges that exist in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are often entrenched and cannot be easily resolved with an easy fix. They take time and they require a long-term investment. A focus on changing behaviours that exist largely because of the limit, limited opportunities and disadvantage that comes with living in remote communities. And it requires strong and committed partnerships and leaderships from community, the service sector and from governments. Because of the nature of the challenges, we need to stay focused on the objective. And those objectives are better lives and better life outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Queenslanders. Staying focused on the objective requires checks and balances, reviewing and evaluating how we are tracking towards our common goals. So in late 2016, the Productivity Commission, or the QPC, was commissioned to look at investment in service delivery in remote and in discrete Indigenous communities in Queensland. What works well, what doesn't, and why? The QPC's final report was publicly released in June this year. It contained 22 recommendations that promote a substantial reform agenda focused on structural reform, service delivery reform, and economic development. Many of the recommendations in the QPC report 
also largely, are largely consistent with other evaluation reports, including, for example, the Overcoming Indigenous Disadvantage reports and the Carmody Review, the recently reduced report on youth justice from former Police Commissioner Bob Atkinson, and I also note uh, some synergy, synergies exist with the Palmer Futures proposal, including principles for development and empowerment for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their communities, and the establishment of local authorising bodies that provide the interface between community-led decision-making and agreements with the Queensland Government. Previous reports also highlight the learnings from the work done in remote and discrete communities through a series of trials. But I know, it's, and all of you here know, it's time to move beyond trials. While some communities have had access to a range of supports through trials, it's now time to start putting those learnings into practice. In response to the QPC report, the Queensland Government has made a long-term commitment to work with the 19 remote and discrete Indigenous uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, community leadership and other key stakeholders to implement this agenda and what we have learnt over time more broadly. This includes transitioning the FRC and welfare reform communities, Arakoon, Hopeval, Mossman Gorge, Cohen and Dumaji, from the existing FRC welfare reform model to what we are calling the thriving communities approach. We are hoping that the approach we are taking assists communities to move beyond surviving to thriving. We are committed to a thriving communities agenda that builds on this long history of research, evidence and practical experience that continues to build on the social capital, community capability and authorised authority that has re-emerged through the work done over the last 10 years and that also builds on the resilience, strengths and abilities of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and individuals, but acknowledging that some families and individuals continue to struggle day to day. We are hoping to reframe the relationship that currently exists where governments do things or do things on behalf of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and hoping that things will change. Instead, we want a relationship where government is guided by communities, where the services we are delivering are provided by local people in response to the priorities and needs identified by those local communities. In this regard, we are committed to working with all communities to ensure access to services that respond to community needs. And this includes a commitment to working closely with community and other stakeholders to co-design the agenda to enable local decision making in communities through local thriving communities authorities and to guide all involved on engagement and implementation at the local level. This is recognition that communities are best placed to understand their own needs. Restoring decision-making authority will allow communities to better identify and implement solutions unique to their situation and support communities to succeed by building long-term sustainable structures and systems with sufficient capacity and capabilities. Finally, I want to note that this reform is not about increasing spending. Current government investment is already significantly high. Instead, this reform is about investing smarter by improving the efficiency and effectiveness of current service delivery, reducing disadvantage and service need, we can save significant costs and deliver services more closely aligned to the needs and priorities of individual communities. Thriving communities is a long-term reform agenda and commitment from government, and we want to get this right. We do not want to undermine our joint efforts by rushing through, ticking boxes and making the same mistakes of the past. The government's role is to enable and facilitate outcomes. We need to ensure that appropriate structures are in place to support this work. We need to work with communities to implement place-based and strength-based policies that support meaningful community reform, and we need to work with services and agencies to respond more appropriately. DATSIP is leading implementation of the thriving remote and discrete Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, or the thriving communities reform agenda. Uh, DATSIP has commenced engaging with communities, including community members, elected leaders and service providers, to co-design reforms that will improve the efficiency and effectiveness of service delivery. The Queensland Government more broadly will continue to work directly with communities to co-design, implement and evaluate the reforms based on strengths and readiness of individual communities. 
As an initial step, the Queensland Government is engaging several remote and discrete communities to identify strengths and build on existing community priorities and partnership work. To progress this agenda, a joint coordinating committee is being established with representatives from both community and government to provide oversight and implement guidance. At the same time, the Ministerial and Government Championship Program will support the implementation and coordination of these reforms and help to strengthen accountability. In conclusion, there is no doubt that we have so much work to do moving forward and it's not possible to go into uh, as all the work that we need to do in five minutes. But we are committed to working with community leaders and members, and members, service providers and all levels of government to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Queenslanders and most importantly, to move from, a survi from surviving communities to thriving communities. And we need to do so. Uh, in, if we are ever going to achieve closing the gap. 